Come on, Pippi. We were supposed to leave for the Shadowfell five minutes ago. This better be a phase. Today, Pippi and I are visiting the Shadowfell. And first you might be asking, what is the Shadowfell? Well, the Shadowfell is a place of blacks and greys that hates light. Just like its more popular sibling, the Feywild, the Shadowfell is a parallel to the material plane. Thus, they share many similarities, but differences abound. Besides the muted landscape, it's much more dangerous. The average encounter in the material plane is but a pale shadow of the average encounter in the Shadowfell. Its sky has no sun nor stars, only an inky black moon giving off ambient light and swirling gloom. Landmarks are familiar from the Material Plane, but what was a mighty mountaintop castle in the Material Plane would be a bleak citadel sitting atop jagged rocks in the Shadowfell. A bustling forest in the Material Plane would be a hot out dead forest with beasties scouring for tasty life force. A recognizable landmark like this in the Shadowfell is called a Shadow Analog. For example, the City of Neverwinter, a bustling and friendly city full of artisans and skilled gardeners, has a Shadow Analog called Evernight. By contrast, Evernight is a city built upon cracked stone and rotting structures full of necromancers and undead. It is truly a shady place. The Shadowfell is one of my favorite places, and I want more people to have adventures there. The goal in this video is to inform as well as inspire. This video is going to start with the meta origins and some history of the Shadowfell and its changes over the years from the Plane of Shadows. We'll then move to features, points of interest, denizens, and more. There will be timestamps for each section, and in the description will be a list of references I used to create the video. The Plane of Shadows has been around since at least the original AD&D Player's Handbook, and over the years, it increased in importance until, in the conversion to 4e, it subsumed the domains of dread and parts of the negative energy plane to become the Shadowfell we know today. It is worth mentioning the frequent thanks from Wizards of the Coast to an individual by the name of Brandon Daggerheart, Keeper of the Shadowfell. Brandon ran a website that consisted of his homebrew changes to the Plane of Shadow, named the Shadowfell. Wizards of the Coast largely adopted many of these changes suggested, so shout out to Brandon Daggerheart. Now let's talk about some of the notable features and phenomena of the Shadowfell. And the most obvious when discussing an adventure in the Shadowfell is light. There's no sun here, but there is day and night. Light is hostile but non-natives can see. Light in the Shadowfell is half as effective, while darkness and illusion spells are empowered. The inky black moon I mentioned earlier gives off ambient light, but it is not sunlight. It is enough to see, but abilities that rely on sight are less effective here. And as mentioned earlier, locations in the Shadowfell mirror the material plane, again called shadow analogs. One might then logically assume that the structure of the Shadowfell is mostly similar to the material plane, such that an expert navigator of Faerun would be able to find a path from the Shadow Analog of Neverwinter to the Shadow Analog of Luskin. But you would be wrong, because the Shadowfell is constantly changing and shifting. What might be a recognizable path one week would look like an insurmountable crag the next. The constant shifting causes local disturbances similar to earthquakes, referred to as shadow quakes. These are capable of interrupting travel spells, such as the Shadow Walk spell, that allow travelers to safely and quickly pass through the plane from one destination to another. The Shadowfell is simultaneously stable in places of interest like Evernight or the Swamp of Cormir, but morphic in the space between. This dull nature might be best explained with an example. Think about casting your own shadow from the noon sun. As the sun moves, your shadow becomes longer and longer, but still retains the same general shape and structure. Tiny and imperceptible second-to-second -second movements add up to become large changes over time. And it's unclear if this morphing of the Shadowfell has a random or cyclic nature, and may even be cyclical on a scale so large as to appear random. In some places that were particularly morphic and filled to the brim with aggressive undead and negative energy were called Darklands. Locations of extreme death and negative emotion typically had a shadow analog that would become a Darkland. For instance, a brutal battleground in the Prime has a high likelihood of having a Darkland shadow analog. And the Shadowfell is largely made up of what is called shadow stuff. It is a mysterious mass present throughout the plane, the essence of the shadow plane. It is equal parts positive and negative energy. Some creatures are purported to be made up of the material, while some spells utilize it. Shadow stuff can also warp living creatures to a form of undead, and shadow stuff could also be used as a material for goods and structures. So low light, shadow quakes, shifting landscapes, powerful and hungry beasties. What else could go wrong? Well, for outsiders who spend time in the Shadowfell, might start to see their emotional state turn melancholic. The Shadowfell will ambiently sap positive energy, including positive emotion, and leave someone with a state of mind akin to depression. This draining of positive energy also caused the creature's experience of time to slow down. Time itself passes normally in the Shadowfell, 
but when a creature is drained of their positive energy, they may experience their own time to slow down to a crawl or lose minutes or hours, as if they had just suddenly jumped an hour into the future, but they don't recall anything they did. Continuous exposure to the Shadowfell could permanently warp a non-native creature. An unlucky and unprepared outsider may find themselves drained to a shriveled and nearly immobile husk that permanently experiences time a thousand times slower than it passes. Now that you have a general understanding of the environment of the Shadowfell, what about the creatures and people that live there? We'll start with the general fauna. The Shadowfell will be full of shadow creatures such as the Shadow Fiend, the Shadow Mastiff, Dark Weavers, and Nightwalkers. One can likely find a shadowy version of any kind of creature here, but the range and number of creatures that exist is much lower than the Prime as resources are much more slim. And thanks to her popularity, I believe the most famous inhabitant of the Shadowfell might be the Raven Queen. The Fortress of Memories is her divine realm where memories and objects with a strong emotional connection are gathered by the Shadar Kai loyal servants of the Raven Queen. The 5e version of the Shadar Kai are cursed elves with an everlasting devotion to the Raven Queen. These people go on missions across the multiverse to gather memories that interest their queen. The Shadar Kai serve until death, but their souls do not pass into the afterlife as they are bound to the Raven Queen forever. And the second most well-known inhabitant of the Shadowfell might be Shar, the mother of the Shadowfell. Shar had a home on the Plane of Shadow called the Palace of Loss, but the abode was destroyed during the Spell Plague and became the foundation of Loss, an entrance to the Lady's new home, the Towers of Night, located somewhere in the Astral Sea. And as the Raven Queen has the Shadar Kai, Shar has the Shades. And aside from some of the previously mentioned places, what are some points of interest you could place in adventure? Some good examples are the cities of Gloomrot, Evernight, and Chalson. Gloomrot, the City of Midnight, is a place in the Shadowfell that would be an excellent home based or a setting for intrigue folks' adventures, as it is largely occupied with the usual suspects and trappings as other cities, just much darker and bleaker and full of Raven Queen acolytes. The humans here are largely the Shadowvar, but ones that never became shades. Enclaves of halflings, tieflings, and dwarves also call this place home, as well as your typical shadow creatures. The humans here ostensibly make up the nobility and are descendants of ancient Netheril that have been colored by their time in the Shadowfell though the power structure here is largely splintered between different groups. And while Gloomrot might be a welcome reprieve from the dark and hostile landscape of the Shadowfell, the city of Evernight is not. Ghouls, ghasts, vampires, necromancers, and worshippers of Baal, Mirkul, and Orcus call this place home. A party looking to fit in would need to sport disguises as necromancers or even undead themselves to avoid being caught out. I find it's actually a place to have a bit of a gaff, as you will find zombies and ghouls casually walking around and living their, uh, unlife or serving some greater undead power. And Chalson, the city of worm shadows, was originally a drow settlement but had been conquered by shadow dragons, and in the following years it declined and now consists of a small ruling class made up of the shadow dragon's descendants. A population of drow, shadarkai, and other shadow creatures also call this place home. Chalcedon is interesting because it occupies space both deep and remote within the Underdark and the Shadowfell. For when you get deep enough into the Underdark, the dark becomes so strong that it begins to become a pathway to the Shadowfell. The Domains of Dread are also located in the Shadowfell. These are constructions of the mysterious dark powers to imprison some of the most evil creatures in the multiverse so as to have a constant source of evil and malicious energy to feed upon, Strahd and Vecna being the most famous evils to be imprisoned here. The Dark Powers in the Domains of Dread are large and interesting enough to deserve their own video, so we'll talk about those at a later date. But maybe by now I've convinced you to have an adventure in the Shadowfell. How would you get there? As I briefly mentioned before, portions of the Underdark become so intensely dark that portals to the Shadowfell spontaneously appear. A non-observant adventurer traversing through the Underdark may find themselves inadvertently stepping through a portal to the Shadowfell. These are called Shadow Crossings, and any place with intense darkness or resonance with the Shadowfell can generate a Shadow Crossing. And how about Shadow Mist? This is famously the way you get into Barovia in the Curse of Strahd campaign, but this mist can take you anywhere in the Shadowfell. A party could even seek out the Shadow Mist by going to a long forgotten graveyard or crypt during dusk or during heavy rain. And the last example for this video is immediately after a TPK. The Raven Queen and the Plane of Shadow have a history with souls passing through to the afterlife and undeath. Perhaps the Queen plucks a party's soul out of the ethereal soup to serve a higher purpose. And that's been Wizen Pip's journey into the Shadowfell. The Shadowfell may be a land of gloom and grey, but it is so much more rich than is often given credit for. This plane is an excellent place to have a mid to high level adventure full of interesting and unique characters and challenges. We'll have more videos covering the Shadowfell in the future, so look out for those. The next will focus on DM resources running adventures in the Shadowfell. So if you want to see that, make sure to subscribe. And also, if you have any ideas for future content, or want to see a different plane, or me talk about anything specifically with the Shadowfell, be sure and comment that below.